well so today we will be starting with our next unit i will first start with the unit on uh, fermi dirac statistics and uh, then we will be discussing bose einstein statistics so uh, before we start talking about fermi dirac statistics let's have a quick overview of uh, maxwell boltzmann statistics what all we have done in the maxwell boltzmann statistics so we have already in our first unit applied the maxwell boltzmann statistics for a study of non interacting uh, distinguishable particles when we were dealing with the ideal gas case and there when discussing this we obtained any thermodynamic properties of uh, the gas and then while discussing those uh, thermodynamic properties we came across a paradox while we were discussing self diffusion of a uh, of a gas and uh, i hope you remember that paradox was called gibbs paradox <clears throat> where we were finding that okay when we mix uh, say same gas kept in two different chambers then what happens that leads to that uh, that sort of mixing leads to the increase in entropy all although that should not happen physically because same gas has been filled in both components of the chamber and uh, the reason for that uh, gibbs paradox then was found to be uh, the fact that we were treating the molecules of gas as in distinguishable ones this has been discussed in detail so i won't be doing uh, all those stuff in detail here but this is just a quick overview of that so that is what we found and then um, because of that distinguishable character of the molecules of the gas led to overestimation of the number of accessible states and uh, hence led to the uh, paradox and then we actually came across the secure tetrode equation which resolved the gibbs paradox and by assuming the particles actually to be indistinguishable we could fix up the things for the gas for the ideal gas and then we also came across the concept of uh, population inversion and ne negative temperatures in that unit now one thing which is very important and worth highlighting here is that uh, uh, when is the, the formalism which we discussed valid and uh, that actually translates in terms of this simple uh, definition like this n into lambda db if it is very very less than 1 then we can apply this maxwell boltzmann statistics which we have discussed so far even for microscopic uh, systems where n is nothing but the particle density or number of particles per unit volume and lambda db is nothing but the de broglie wavelength so if those two or the product of these two quantities is less than 1 or very very less in comparison to 1 in that case maxwell boltzmann statistics can satisfactorily explain behavior of the system why so because when n is uh, very small then what does it mean is that we have very fewer particle in a given volume and hence the particles are far separated from each other and when they are separated far away from each other those particles can be taken or uh, treated like classical particles and uh, we don't need to bother about uh, how would their wave character affect their behavior and on the other hand uh, if we also assume that okay lambda db or de broglie wavelength is very small uh, in that case that is uh, another way of saying the same thing when lambda de broglie uh, when de broglie wavelength is very small then if we have two particles which are kept at a distance which is reasonably large in comparison to the de broglie wavelength of those particles then of course the particles are not so close and their wave character uh, would not be interfering with each other i mean if we consider first particle to be having some wave associated with it and uh, similarly there is another wave associated with another particle if those particles are brought very close to each other what may happen is that those waves associated with the particles 
may display certain weird phenomena or say wave like phenomena interference diffraction all those things can be displayed by the particles so therefore uh, those limits actually refer to the quantum mechanical limits and those are the situations when maxwell boltzmann statistics is no longer valid and we have to actually consider quantum effects another way of saying it is uh, is that uh, uh, this maxwell boltzmann statistics is valid at high temperature low densities low density we already discussed high temperature means there is another way of saying it that okay i mean interaction uh, energy or the potential energy of the particle should be uh, very very less in comparison to the uh, kinetic energy of the particles that's another way of looking at it if this is the situation means particles are weakly interacting and they are having very high kinetic energy means high temperatures then also we can say that maxwell boltzmann statistics will hold good but in case there is a deviation from that suppose we uh, cool down a gas to very low temperatures and uh, at the same time we try to compress the gas and try to bring the particles close to each other then what will happen this product say n into lambda db this will be uh, increasing and in case it becomes closer or comparable to one we may say that we have to go beyond maxwell boltzmann statistics <coughs> so this i already told you i mean quantum effects in that case will become very important and this of course happens at uh, low temperatures and high densities and that is why we should actually uh, bother about other two statistics which we are now going to discuss in this unit so a physical system uh, in that case is said to be degenerate system so we mean by degenerate system means there will be so many particles which will be trying to occupy same energy state because the density of the particles is very high uh, uh so in that case they would like to uh, go to same energy state or many particles would be having a tendency to go to particular energy state so means whenever we compress particles at a high densities and low temperatures in that case they will the system will become reasonably degenerate we will be talking about degeneracy in little detail so <clears throat> because of that um, what will happen the quantum effects will become more prominent uh, for example the atoms of helium at low temperature they exhibit very interesting uh, characteristics in uh, atoms of helium at low temperatures uh, they display because of those quantum mechanical effects a very interesting behavior called superfluidity you may come across somewhere so the superfluidity in helium is one of the manifestation of uh, those complex quantum effects which arises because of this number being comparable to uh, one uh, another very interesting example which we already have discussed assembly of photons black body radiation of course you saw that uh, it was actually the quantum uh, treatment of those uh, photons which was missing in the earlier approaches and uh, that is why people were not able to explain black body radiation for a very long so actually assembly of photons is also to be treated quantum mechanically induction electrons in metal this we will be discussing all these uh, uh, or some of these examples during uh, this unit so conduction electrons in metal for example that is also a case when this n into db is close to 1 and uh, that is why those have to be treated quantum mechanically now let us try to discuss case of ideal quantum gases so, so if we are talking of quantum gases what does it mean is those gases where the uh, what you call quantum mechanical effects are more prominent those are called quantum gases and classical gas classical gases are the gases which have uh, <clears throat> negligible quantum effects or those gases which can be described within uh, uh, this uh, maxwell boltzmann statistics can be treated as classical gases so now uh, 
we will be uh, seeing how does this particle distribution and internal energy of uh, quantum gases we can how we can define the particle distribution and internal energy expressions for the quantum gases we have already done the same thing for classical gases so now we want to do it for this plus quantum case so now let us uh, uh, recall our unit 1 when we were discussing uh, all these statistics there we had obtained an expression for uh, occupation number which actually is nothing but the probability that a particular state is occupied uh, by some particles then that uh, occupation number for that specific state having some energy say es this occupation number can be defined by this expression i hope you have seen this expression in very well uh, in, in our first unit we have seen this expression so I'm not going to talk about this in details but yes this is your occupation number and uh, here what is this we have here introduced a more generalized notation for occupation number so we are not saying okay it is uh, different for bosons or different for fermions in general it can be written like this and if you want to separate it out for bosons and fermions it can be done with the help of this some simple numbers of kappa where kappa is equal to minus 1 for bosons. I hope you remember that definition then 1 over e raised to the power of beta where beta is this 1 upon kbt uh, where kb is the Boltzmann constant. We have also seen this factor in our first unit in far more details how this factor comes and all. So this is minus 1. So you know for bosons it was minus 1 and for fermions it was plus 1. So that's the simple. Okay. Now uh, for a macroscopic uh, sample, we uh, can actually replace this ns by a continuous distribution. So this is, suppose this can be in general for a discrete system where we have discrete energy states where s represents the energy <coughs> level index or quantum number say we can say. But in case we have a macroscopic sample then we may have other than discrete but uh, we, we, we may have continuous distribution of energy states so in that case this distribution uh, function or we can say the occupation number can actually be written to be like this uh, an example of uh, this uh, continuous energy states is a free electron gas hope you have done it in your uh, uh, this uh, solid state physics course where we uh, used to write down energy for free electron gas is equal to say h cross square k square over 2m right and that was a continuous continuous so means in uh, free electron gas the energy states are continuous and we talk about uh, this uh, quantum mechanical free electron gas that was discussed within Sommerfeld theory so all those things there i mean i'm, I'm not going into details of uh, solid state physics here but yes, that's a very good example to quote the real life example where we may have continuous distribution of energies even in the quantum mechanical systems. So in that case, we can write down this expression or uh, occupation number as this. Now, um, if we focus on the number of particles within uh, say some element of the phase space having say volume dq bar dq p, uh, then that is nothing but the product of number of quantum states lying in that particular volume say of the phase space times the occupation number means it is something like okay uh, this product of uh, quantum states you know, this tells you how many states are available and occupation number tells you what is the probability of uh, those states to uh, be occupied so therefore if you want to find out the number of particles we have to just multiply uh, with the two numbers because if there are states but the probability is very very zero, uh, less or say ideally zero suppose in that case we won't be having particle in those states so those states won't be contributing to the counting of the particle and if a particular state is completely filled then you may say okay number of particles are equal to the number of states which are occupied correct so that's another way of looking at this so uh, if this is so then we can write down the total number of uh, say quantum states of energy E within this volume element 
Now what we want to do is, okay, let us assume that this is some small volume element of the phase space and we want to count how many quantum states would be lying in this volume of phase space. So we have already done this in our previous classes that uh, number of quantum states will be equal to volume of the phase space divided by h cube where h cube is nothing but the volume of each state in the phase space or quantum mechanical systems. So total volume divided by volume of each state will be giving you number of states. That's the simple uh, expression. So now if we use that thing then we can write down the expression for uh, say some small particles lying between say uh, lying in say phase space volume say d cube r d cube p l will be given by this. So this represents the number of states because it is just this is total volume of the phase space. This is the volume of each state. So this will be giving you number of states in the phase space times the occupation number or probability of the state to be occupied. Uh, uh, please uh, note that this number L here or subscript L here is uh, actually trying to represent the P that is linear momentum um, and uh, if we I mean write P as such then this we may confuse it with pressure so just to avoid that confusion of P being interpreted as pressure we have written it PL because uh, in uh, uh, some of the uh, conditions or situations we will be uh, dealing with the pressure as well there we will be using P for pressure and if we are writing PL that would mean for momentum about so <coughs> system of uh, say one type of particles can often be separated into several subsystems distinguishable from each other and uh, we can divide that system uh, any particular system in small subsystems in terms of uh, certain property or uh, even in terms of size as well for example uh, you take an example of a crystal which is very big unit in practical so you can divide it in terms of small small unit cells right so in terms of volume we are dividing our bigger system into small subsystems so that if we are only considering on a particular subsystem then we can write down the total property to be equal to the product of total number of subsystems times the property comp computed for a subsystem right so in that case suppose we are dividing our full system uh, in terms of uh, say g such uh, subsystems or in g such subsystems therefore we can write down this dn to be equal to g times d cube or d cube pl over h cube is this now here this portion or the our phase space would now be corresponding to the phase space of the subsystem for example um, our full crystal will have a uh, brilliant zone of course uh, which is uh, different so instead of uh, talking about the brilliant zone uh, or the reciprocal lattice of the real lattice full reciprocal lattice of the real lattice we actually define reciprocal lattice uh, in terms of unit cell so in that sense we can find out okay dn is equal to g times how many unit cells are there in crystal times the volume of the uh, reciprocal lattice that is corresponding to or brilliant zone you can say coming from the unit cell uh, so dn is nothing but simply we can write down dn to be equal to g times this thing so when the energy of interaction between particles making up the system is negligibly small the energy of a state the e is independent of its position it's also something uh, interesting which you should notice that if the particles are such that those particles are not very strongly interacting or we can say they are not very very densely packed that's one way of looking at it because if we try to interpret interaction among the particles 
and we know that uh, interaction usually depends upon the position of the particles relative distance between the particle right so closer are the particles strongly they are interacting so interaction means we are trying to talk about say potential energy of the particles so if those are not very strongly interacting then the energy of the state or energy of such a system can be written to be almost independent of positions of the particle because particles are not very strongly interacting so means their potential is also not a very uh, sharply varying function of their positions or their uh, relative separation so therefore even if they are moving here and there the interaction won't be affected much that's what is the idea behind this simple line so in that case what we can say is that um, energy is independent of position of the particles if so then what we can do is actually that the integral if we have to find out the total number of particles then ultimately we have to integrate over this so that integral with respect to the space coordinates of the particle can be taken outside the uh, say i mean it can be simply taken to be the volume of the system p it is possible only when particles are weakly interact because in case they are strongly interacting a small change in position of the particles may lead to the large change in their energies their interaction energies and then in that case this particular approximation will not be and we have to be careful so in that case what we can do is we can replace this d cube r with respect to with with p similarly if the energy of uh, the state does not depend on the direction in which particle is moving it's also something very interesting <laughs> now suppose that you know, we have uh, so this is our momentum space so now suppose that uh, uh, the energy of the particle doesn't depend on whether the particle is here in this direction anywhere so if the energy of the particles is fixed or the momentum value pl means it is only related to the magnitude of the momentum but not the direction of the momentum that's what is important right so in that case we can treat this volume in the momentum space also to be uh, relatively very simpler very simple in the sense that okay we can consider this to be a sphere of radius say pl this volume element in phase space or momentum space can be treated to be like a sphere of radius a pl because uh, in the, this only depends upon the magnitude of the momentum but not the direction so in that case what we can say d cube p can be written as d square p uh, pl into d pl right and d square pl will be nothing but the surface area of a sphere of radius say pl and uh, therefore that's what we have done here means d cube p we have written to be 4 pi pl square uh, into d pl so this 4 pi pl square is nothing but the area of the sphere right 4 pi r square i hope you remember area of surface of the sphere having radius say pl so means this can be simplified further so if we use these uh, simplifications then we can write down dn to be equal to g Times 4 pi pl square. That's 4 pi pl square. This is the volume coming for d cube r, d pl, h cube. Fine. <clears throat> Now we know that energy for a non-relativistic particle. Let us not bother about very uh, fast-moving particle as of now. In case we are dealing with the relativistic particles, then we have to update this expression for energy for. let us okay keep our life simple for time being that okay if the particles are just non relativistic and since they are not interacting very strongly so we can neglect their potential energy therefore we can write down the total energy is nothing but because of their so it is just mainly contribution to energy is coming kinetic energy so if we do so and what we can do from here we can just uh, rearrange things in terms of energy so from here i can say okay pl square is equal to 2 me right pl square from here will be e 
and uh, then if I have to write down PL square EPL, then that will be equal to uh, under root of uh, 2m2. So basically, okay, here, um, if I have to write down, um, you, you can simplify it in, it on your notebook. So I can say, okay, PL square is equal to 2ME. So that PL is equal to square root of 2ME, right? PL is equal to square root of 2ME. So that I have to write down expression for DP in terms of DE. Then this is just a change of variable. Then we can simplify and then obtain that the whole thing will come out to be equal to this. I leave it to you as a short homework. You should be able to find it out. So if we use, I mean here now what we have done is we have changed the variable of integration from momentum to energy. Now if <coughs> so or if we substitute these values, what we can write down that g is nothing but 2 pi. Now why 2 here? Because it, it, it was 4 here. Now here it is 2 because one of the 2 has been taken here. So uh, this is 2 raised to the power 3 by 2, right? So there is 1 under root 2 here means 2 raised to power 1 by 2. 1, 2 has been taken from here. So which is say, 2 raised to the power. So 2 raised to power 1 plus into 2 raised to power 1 by 2 will be 2 raised to power 3 by 2. That is why it has been merged here in this form. And uh, only we are left with 2 pi. V volume as such, no problem, over H cube. G, this all is as such. We are writing is D, yes, P square DPL. So P square DPL. Out of that, something has been taken here. Uh, one thing which we will be left with is E raised to the power half. So that's what we have taken. E, e this part. And this is nothing but corresponding to this denominator is corresponding to NE. I hope you remember the question for occupation number. This was 1 over e raised to the power beta epsilon minus mu plus kappa, right? Okay, now if we simplify this further a little and uh, try to replace this complicated longer expression with a simple thing, uh, say let us say b, v, the volume remains as such, then the remaining thing we are substituting it to b with the, some constant say c. And this constant is constant actually. I mean, it doesn't depend upon energy. Pi fixed, 2 is fixed, and mass of the particles is fixed. So on which particle system we are talking of. Or C will depend upon nature of the particles. H is a universal uh, constant, so no problem. So G is also a number. How many subsystems we have been uh, <coughs> taken? How many subsystems we have? So if we uh, now try to see this expression in two extreme limits, so this is this is giving you particle distribution. So one thing uh, which we wanted to obtain was the particle distribution. So this is telling us, okay, how dn should be uh, equal to this. Uh, I mean, how dn, number of uh, particles in a particular energy range, say E and E plus dE, should be uh, distributed. How many particles should lie between energy range E and E plus DE? So this can be obtained from this. So let us uh, see uh, the same expression in say low energy limit. So if energy is low, I mean E is very very low. So say suppose it is close to zero. And in that case, we can say that this term in the denominator will be approaching close to one. This term will be approaching close to 1. Why so? Because this exponential term will be reaching close to reaching close to 0. And uh, this k is nothing but 1. So we can find out. You can try to write a, I mean, if you want to see it in detail, you can try to plot this graph uh, of denominator with the e taken as a variable and then you can try to see how this varies and you will find out that for small values of energy this will be close to uh, this part will be close to zero and this will be equal to one so 
is something what is interesting uh, here is that in low energy limit this dn over de is proportional to e raised to the power half i mean we have taken de to this side this is dn over de is proportional to e raised to power the same so so keep this result i mean we shall be using it somewhere in our coming uh, slides so in high energy limit how we can write down this dn over de and that the dn over de can be written to be like this now now we are talking of high energy limits so in high energy limits this is e raised to the power energy right now when this is very very high then this factor will dominate this factor can be taken to be very small in comparison to this factor so therefore we can say that in high energy limit this dn over de will be actually proportional to e raised to the power minus beta e this some sort of um, Maxwell Boltzmann uh, thing which we come across will be seeing all those things as and when they so this is this this number is also called density of states this d n over d e is also called density of states means number of states per unit energy level unit volume right? So now let us discuss this. Uh, this this first uh, column here is uh, trying to now we are trying to see this expression. Means how does this d n varies or this d e actually this this is density of state d e written in this next graph. So now we want to see that how does particle distribution differ for whether our system is fermion or it is a boson. And to see this, okay, let us first focus on for so this is our density of states so here i doubt this is wrong and uh, should not be dn over de <coughs> uh, just a moment it should be oh, fine it can be okay it is okay we can write it to be dn over de number of particles fine it is fine so what is this is de this is nothing but giving counting of the states number of states at a particular energy value and what will that be that will be proportional to e raised to the power and that is how we uh, this expression so this is proportional to so this has not been uh, so this is actually related to de this first part is related to de right I mean, um, this tells you number of states at a particular energy value. So you can see from here, number of states at a particular energy value is proportional to e raised to the power of half. So this portion, this portion, except for n e, is nothing but, you can say, is related to the density of states or number of energy states at a particular energy value. So this is proportional to e raised to the power. So this, this is uh, nothing but e raised to power half dependence of d e. It's like a parabola around x axis you know, e is power half if you square on both sides then e is equal to de square isn't it so that's just a parabola like fine so now this these two things are actually represent so this first one is density of state as i told you this is a low temperature situation <coughs> and uh, then this is occupation number now i'll be coming to this high temperature case just uh, shortly this is density of state e raised to power half dependent this is occupation number now this is your uh, this uh, distribution function uh, say fermi dirac distribution function means whenever uh, let me go back just a little quickly just a minute yeah if we come here then for fermions this is one so this this function now has been plotted there so where is temperature sitting as such the temperature is sitting only in beta fine so i hope you have seen the plots of uh, fermi dirac distribution function in your solid state physics course somewhere so when we take it to be plus one the plots will look like i have shown here right so this is your occupation function so what does this tell us the total number of electrons per unit energy level this is dn number of electrons per unit energy level 
So we can uh, write this uh, down. I mean, this is just the product of this and this. Whereas this function is product of this and this. You can go back in the previous equation, previous page. So this dn over de, if I take it here, and this is nothing but the product of ne, the distribution function, times the density of state, correct? That's what we have been uh, representing here. So we can write down that this will give you how many electrons are there in at a particular energy value. So what we can find out is that this, this is actually referring to the Fermi level. We'll be talking about Fermi level um, in our coming uh, lectures as well. This is nothing but corresponding to mu actually, this is mu, the uh, chemical potential in the previous equation. When we are defining this occupation number, we come across called mu. We didn't talk much about it, it is called chemical potential. And uh, <coughs> for uh, fermions, we will be calling it as a Fermi level. So now, uh, this one, we can say, okay, at mu, when E is equal to mu, because most of the electrons will be filled below Fermi level. That's what is the characteristic of the fermions. That is why this dn will vanish here. What will be the thing is that, okay, below Fermi level, I mean, all these states are filled and above it, all these states are empty. So we have a density of state here, means suppose here is the Fermi level, so you do have states above that Fermi level, but the occupation function goes to zero, right? So that the product of these two goes to zero here. This is dn upon de goes to zero. We have states, but still no electrons there. Because the probability of those states to get or to be occupied is zero or close to zero because of this occupation. And uh, then if you want to find out the total number of electrons, we can just integrate, right? If you have to find out n, and we have to integrate this, this, and uh, take this to right hand side, and then we can find electrons. Fine, anyway, I'm not uh, going into much details here. I think you would have done it in your solid state physics somewhere. Thank you. Uh, now, this is the situation for high temperatures. Now, high temperatures, density of state doesn't uh, change. It remains unaffected because it doesn't have any factor of temperature. You can go back and try to look at the expression. But yes, this occupation number, this has beta sitting in it, one upon kBT. So it's it's uh, nature changes its uh, distribution its characteristics change high temperature and that is how we can see how does overall dn over d de or the, the distribution of electrons with or distribution of fermions in general uh, with energy would be affected because of temperature so this is how temperature affects the distribution function or the distribution of the uh, particles and specifically fermions. The same thing done for bosons. Again, this is a little exercise you can try with the simple Fortran programs. So DE remains same, E raised to the power half type. But uh, you see for, for uh, say low temperatures, occupation numbers for fermions, sorry, bosons goes like this. Again, this can be obtained by writing a simple computer program and trying to see the so we can see the plots and whenever uh, in, uh, the E is equal to mu, uh, above this it is totally zero. So you can get, I mean, and if we take the product of these two functions, you will be finding how these uh, bosons distribute themselves uh, at different energies. So this is the distribution function for the bosons, low temperatures. And at high temperatures, same thing. Um, DE remains same, NE changes like this, and then DN over DE looks like this. So this is how we can represent the distribution function for bosons at low and high temperature. So what is the effect of temperature can be seen here clearly. Okay, so having done this, we can uh, let us uh, try to find out expression for say total number of particles. And uh, then total number of particles will follow from the integral. You have to integral from or over all the energy ranges. 
say from zero to infinity. So that's what we were earlier talking. We can write down the total particles that is just the integral. This <coughs> means we have to uh, integrate this over all the energy ranges zero to infinity. Why we need to go to infinity? You may say, okay, energy can't be infinite, right? Of course it can't be, but even if we take energy to be going all the way up to infinity, then this distribution function will be zero there. So that hardly affect our at all. Fine. The energy of the system whose particles have energies in the range, say E and E plus DE, is equal to the product of number of such particles and energy of each part. Isn't it? So total energy, if I have to write down, that will be nothing but uh, equal to total energy of the system will be equal to the number of particles lying in a particular energy level and the value of the energy of that particular energy level. So same way, I mean, suppose there are the n particles in say energy level E, therefore the energy contribution because of those uh, dn particles will be e, e equal to say e times dn this one so that if we have to write down the uh, total energy then i mean say total energy for the particles lying between say energy e and e plus de and that will be nothing but n force dn rather times E. So now here it was e raised for half, now it will become e raised for 3 by 2. So first we have to multiply this with the factor e. So this will give us the energy. Similarly, I mean, uh, by using the same idea, we can integrate this to find out the total energy, and total energy will be given by e is equal to c into v integral of this thing. Now our main objective is all this integral. And uh, if we have to solve this integral, we can solve this integral by using integration by part. And uh, I am uh, very much confident that you all are very well uh, comfortable with uh, solving integration by part. So here we can take uh, one of the function to be first function, then second function, and then you know uh, integral of first function into second function will do first function integral of second function minus integral derivative of first function second function so on I mean, that you can do so this will be c into v this is already there so here what we are doing is we are taking this this uh, uh, this function as uh, the first function uh, sorry this one 1 over e raised to the power beta into this mu a we are taking it as first function right so that uh, function integral of second so integral of second means e raised to the power by 2 divided so first function second function minus integral of differential of first right uh, so that's what we are doing and try to work it out yourself if you face trouble just get back to me uh, you have to sit with the notebook and then paint. I believe you can finally reach at this expression. So that has been done here. And then you can write down total number <coughs> particles to be given by this. Okay, okay. This is not for, I mean, this is not 3 by 2. This is not for energy. I was a little. Integral of this can lead to this itself. So this is. In, uh, this is actually for number of particles. So we have actually integrated this this here and obtained this. So first we are trying to find expression for. So here, this is your first function, correct? And this is your second function. So first function integral of second. So what is integral of second? Integral of e raised to the power half de. And what will be that? So that will be e raised to the power half plus 1 divided by half plus 1 itself. So half plus 1 is 3 by 2. So that becomes here 2 by 3 because it was. So that's the, that's it. So first term. Similarly, second thing. Right? Integral of differential of first. So all that has been worked out. Yourself. And that is how you can write down the expression for n.
I leave it to you now. So the first term vanishes. This first term actually vanishes. Why? Because both the limits are leading to the zero value. It is leading to zero value because uh, when we put infinity here, then denominator this term is very very large. When e is very very large, denominator becomes very large. So this is large, but this is exponential of this function. So this term will down. I hope you have seen this. In high energy limit, this expression reaches to e raised to the power plus. So therefore, at infinity. This term is zero. Similarly, when we do zero here, low, no, low energy limit also, this numerator will lead to zero. So first term will vanish. Simple. So therefore, we can write down that n is equal to this expression. Now, let us uh, try to evaluate this integral. So now we have taken just that previous expression. So n is equal to this. Just focus on this integral. Solve this. So to solve this integral, we have done further little rearrangement of this here, and uh, we are actually trying to write this thing. So try to pay attention to this. Right here, you have got a square term. This comes off of the derivative thing. You integrate by part. Integral of the second term. What it is? Integral of derivative of first. So is what comes out of that. Anyway, let us focus on this part. This part, right? So e raised to power beta e minus mu divided by e raised to power beta e minus mu is k square, k whole square, right? So this. So let us try to write down this like. This. Now, how to get this? I hope you have done it uh, probably in your eight classes. Different techniques to solve the integrals, right? To detail, but okay. Let us uh, write this in this manner that we take one over e raised to the power. This this term. So means I am taking one of the term side, so that I'm here one of the side. So what I shall be left inside. Now I'm 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 not saying okay. I'm left with e raised to the power this over this term itself, but rearranging this in this manner, so that if you solve things in the bracket. So for that you have to just take LCM here, e raised to the power beta minus mu plus k plus k as such minus k plus k minus k cancels. So this will be nothing. Same thing which we should actually get. <coughs> now uh, if we use uh, the same same this notation, so therefore we can write down this integral for n to be 2 by 3 cv into beta, the same thing. Now this integral splits into two. First integral coming because of this term, right? And second integral coming because of this term. So the first integral, so e raised to power three by two. This is as such. Then uh, of course one over uh, e raised to the power beta e minus mu plus k. This is the same thing because one will multiply through this. So this and then second term, this one. Right. So notice here you have a k sitting here. Right. So if we uh, try to uh, solve it further and rearrange things a little more, then what we have done here is we have taken beta to be equal to one over kBT and taken that kBT to the left hand side. And this two by three has been taken again to left hand side. This will be three by two n into kB into t. So why we did this? You should be able to should this. This is something very familiar to us. 3 by 2 n into kBT. Isn't it? Equipartition theorem. So this is our left hand side, correct? So this is C V. Uh, this is same thing as such, I think. Not yet solved. Yes, we have now multiplied by C V to both the integrals. So C V, K, and this. Fine. So this we already have done. If we uh, do so, then if you see this, this is nothing but the expression for energy. If you are not uh, convinced, go back to the previous slide and uh, try to see this. So this one is nothing but the expression for 
energy and there this one is exactly the same this one is e so what we have done is we have written this e kept this thing here on left hand side itself taken this to the left hand side itself fine so that's what we have done so e is equal to 3 by 2 n k b t plus minus now why plus minus because here is a k sitting here so if it will go there it will be plus as such okay let us take it like k times something right now if we take k times then for fermions k bonds equal to plus one right so and for bosons it is minus one so that is why we are saying okay let us put the, the values of k exclusively and we will be having plus minus some function zeta mu of beta of u t where this function is nothing but this is exactly the same thing right so we have written this whole integral in some short form like this correct <clears throat> and then this also has been uh, further simplified this is nothing but n e square this one so 1 over e raised to the power beta e minus mu plus k raised to the power of is nothing but n e square right e raised to the power 3 by 2 this so this is a new function which we have come so means from here if we write down then we can see is that okay the total energy of uh, the particles for a quantum mechanical system uh, quantum mechanical because uh, we have now been talking uh, a general formalism right we have taken <coughs> uh, quantum mechanical distributions as such so we have been taking Maxwell sorry, Bose-Einstein distribution function and uh, Towards the Fermi Dirac distribution function. That is why we can write down that E is equal to 3 by 2 this. So this is for a quantum mechanical system. This thing becomes crucial, and that is actually so. This is if we ignore this, and this is nothing but the classical system, just equal partition, and this is the energy of a classical system. But when this thing comes into picture means what we are trying the quantum mechanics. This this thing becomes actually crucial when the particle densities become higher. Why so? You can try to see uh, uh, it's not given here as such particle densities. So it is sitting here in C. I, I don't know it's written. You try to go back to the previous slide. Uh, okay, let me go back to the previous slides. Why we have talked about particle densities? That's what I want to highlight here. Uh, okay, it's not in this one as such. Okay, fine, no problem. Uh, this will be coming in multiple situations, so I won't be talking this right here. But yes, this term is crucial when the particle densities are higher. Okay. The quantum mechanical effects becomes significant when particles are densely packed. Their potential energy is very, very high in kinetic energy or is of comparable. Now, uh, total energy for a non relativistic fermion system is greater than classical predictions so from here we can say okay we have to take plus for fermions and minus for bosons you can work out yes yeah, i mean for fermions it was plus one for bosons it was minus one right so now we can see that okay from this expression that system of fermions the total energy will be higher than the classical total energy or the energy predicted by two partition why does that happen because fermions are uh, restricted by something which we call uh, all these exclusion principle so all the particles can't go to a single state right so there is a restriction that okay no more than two electrons can occupy same same quantum state so because of that what will happen that we can't pack too many of fermions in say some lower energy states and that is why they have to follow some discipline as per so, Fermi Dirac distribution or 
as per the restrictions imposed by the this exclusion principle so therefore articles some will go here some will go to higher energy state some will has to go to higher further higher energy states and so on. so that overall energy of the thermia system greater than physical counterpart whereas in case of bosons there is no such restrictions so what will happen is that those bosons can even try to go down even a single energy level they are not bound by any such restriction so their energy you see here the energy of the bosons will be e by 2 nkt minus this quantum can correction term say this will be subtracted from the energy so therefore total energy is right so the, the sonic systems can have energy is even more lower uh, even lower than those of classical counterparts and this lowering lead to many interesting effects so all these i mean even even these uh, say pauli's exclusion principle leads to very interesting properties of the fermi systems and in bosons also this uh, leads to this lowering of energy leads to very interesting effects like uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, where many bosons actually enters to the lowest energy state, and then has also been known to be another state of matter, Einstein condensate. So this leads to many interesting observable uh, things, like superconductivity is one such uh, very interesting property which arises from the Bose-Einstein condensation, where uh, pairs of electrons which we call Cooper pairs enters into a state both Einstein colors so anyway that's not uh, the thing which we have to discuss as such in details here yes means this is how these uh, mechanical effects manifest themselves and uh, and many interesting properties can be obtained because of those quantities. now similarly we can write the expression for pressure you know pressure pv is equal to 2 by 3 times e see this expression somewhere earlier so i'm not going to it if we can do that you know we know energy energy is given by this so we can say okay pressure for gases you can say fermi dirac gas for example electron gas can be referred to as fermi dirac gas right so the pressure for the gas made up of the fermions will be higher than the pressure for maxwell boltzmann uh, and of course it will it can be lowest will be lowest for those of uh, bosons so that is how the and say the quantum mechanical effects do manifest themselves and then according to what kind of particles we are dealing with we have to take the formalism as well so that's how we can write down the expression for the pressure we just have write down nothing it's 2 by 3 e if you write down 2 by 3 e this factor will cancel this will be n abt plus minus 2 by 3 factor as such okay well then there is something another interesting parameter which we used to characterize the extent of quantities present present in the system and this actually called degeneracy we define a number called a which is equal to e raised to the power 2 u is that chemical product is 1 over t this term is called degeneracy or fugacity also now it is this term which actually uh, is used to measure the extent of quantum mechanical effects in the system okay so quantum mechanical effects are very negligible or we say will be this in case system is weakly degenerate this number a is very now i am writing it as such directly to you so we will be doing it in our coming slides that okay how this condition is arrived at so if a is very very less in compared can say our systems are weakly degenerate and then 
will do the formalism for weekly degenerate systems. We will see that in detail. So in the coming slides or in the coming lecture, we shall be talking about weekly degenerate quantum systems where A is very, very small in comparison to one. We shall also be take, talking about strongly degenerate quantum systems where A is comparable to one. And then this, I'm just trying to present the whole summary of this unit, which we will be doing in the coming lectures. And we will be discussing applications of Fermi Dirac set stage six. Usually, what we come across the question that okay, where all this uh, complex mathematical formalism is useful in real life, right? So now that is where we will be seeing that how these uh, applications of Fermi Dirac statistics can be applied to many phenomena which we observe in our and those phenomena can be explained very successfully. One such is uh, thermoionic emission. We will be talking about photoelectric effect, electrons in the metal, that the thing, white dwarf stars, all those things we will be discussing. So now I think uh, before proceeding further, realizing that this lecture has been going very long, and so better to stop here. In next lecture, I will be uh, starting with the weekly degenerate quantum systems. So this probably will come to you tomorrow. So just get it done, this lecture done today itself, so that tomorrow you can go through this next lecture. Now I will be posting my lectures daily. So please uh, do catch up with the things so that you can cover those things as and when they are done. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can put your questions on so that I can help you. Thank you.